All right, so guys, uh, welcome back. Now we are going to dive into module development because now we have seen how to use Orchard as a content management system when we are running it on our own machines. We have looked into uh, theme development, uh, which is also an important aspect and uh, kind of an entry level uh, development task. And now we are actually going to write server side code for real um, that actually does something uh, to extend what Orchard is capable of, of what an uh, out-of-order Orchard installation is capable of. So the first thing we're, we're going to have to do is something very similar that we have done with theme development. We're actually going to create a module. So the first thing we need to do is go back to orchard.exe. Uh, as far as I know, that's the correct uh, uh, pronunciation, but probably uh, YouTube commenters will uh, Correct me if that's not okay. Uh, so we are back to the Orchard command line. And uh, what we're going to do is also very similar. We're going to say CodeGAN module. And the name of the module should be Dojo Course 2. Dot, uh, module. And to be able to see what kind of options are available, we can use the help. But we are developers. So the source code is, is more important and more interesting. So we are going to look at uh, orchard.code generation very briefly. Uh, the code generation command uh, class also contains some methods to generate uh, modules, just like with themes. So if you, if you take a look at uh, code can, where are you? Actually, it's easier to find it here. So. Uh, Create module. There you are. So, oh, no. So create module. Uh, so the um, only switch that is available here is including solution, which is the same uh, as it works with themes. Um, you can't actually customize what solution uh, should be involved with this uh, because you know uh, by default you have an orchard.sln but we use a custom solution because we don't want to uh, we don't want to modify the built-in solution file because when you are upgrading to a new orchard version you will just overwrite it so then you're screwed basically and you have to redo your changes again uh, so we're using a custom solution which you can't define here so if you say including solution true, it will always add to orchard.sln, not your custom one. You can select the custom one. So we're not going to use the switch. But just to be sure that we are familiar with what's happening here and what's, what's available to us, I'm showing you this. So we are just going to say um, include in solution ooh, false. So um, our module has been created successfully. Uh, its name is Dojo Course 2, Dojo Course 2 module. So what we're going to do is go back to our solution. And uh, I think we have uh, Dojo Course 2 that theme in the themes folder. I just click, click it at um, uh, solution folder uh, to keep the solution a bit tidier. Uh, we, this is a practice that we usually do. So when you are creating custom uh, modules or when you are adding third-party modules to your solution, um, it's easier to separate them into a separate, uh, to, a, to a different uh, solution folder so it doesn't get mixed up with the built-in ones because there are like, I don't know, 70 or 60 uh, built-in modules. So there's a lot of them. Uh, so let's call it uh, custom modules. And what you're going to do here is just right-click on custom modules, add existing project. And we're going just going to browse uh, through the through the uh, folder structure uh, to Dojo Course that, to that module. Um, by the way, since Orchard one dot ten, I think there's another uh, kind of functionality that you can use, and you can uh, define it in the web config file of the Orchard dot web project uh, to be able to use um, different folders other than modules and themes to actually store extensions. So you can say that I have a custom modules folder in my orchard.web folder. You can also put extensions there, but you need to uh, define these additional paths in the web config file. Um, I can actually show you there's an example there. So we're just going to jump back to modules, dojo course.module, and add the CS project there. Uh, so if I open up uh, orchard.web, just to show you what's going on, uh, you can open up web config. And as you can see uh, in the F setting session, section um, 
we can actually add, add additional uh, keys uh, uh, for modules and the value should be uh, the, uh, the path to the folder where you can uh, where you want to store additional extensions uh, relative to the orchard.web folder. So that's why it starts with the tilde character. Okay. So if that's clear, now we have uh, we have generated our first module, Dojo Course 2, that module, and we have added it to our uh, to our solution file successfully. So there's some basic bootstrapping that we need to do in this case as well, just like with themes. Um, let's take a look at um, module.txt. Of course, just like with themes, we need to define uh, a nicer name uh, because you know this is a technical name basically. But what's in the name? Uh, value actually is, is what is going to be displayed uh, to the users on the admin, admin, admin UI. So we're just going to rename that. Um, and the forgery should be remain enabled. Author is Lombic Technologies LTD. And the website is lombic.com. Well, you can define your own in your own projects, of course. So version is 1.0. Um, well. So let's say that we didn't do anything, but this is also that this is already 1.0 because this is a great module and it's already working nicely. Well, we haven't implemented any bugs yet, so it's working great, right? Um, and then Orchard version should be the version of the Orchard uh, uh, release that it's compatible with. Um, one of uh, thing that could be improved in Orchard is to actually have like. Um, um, uh, a multi-version uh, declaration for this, so you know your module can be can be compatible with 1.9, uh, but not necessarily with 1.10, and also the other way around. Right now, there is not really a nice way to define whether your module or your extension is compatible with multiple different Orchard versions. So we're just going to say that Orchard 1.10.1 because that's the uh, Orchard version that we are using here. So the description should be like same thing. Uh, this is a demo module for Dojo Course 2. And um, actually, um, this is a spoiler alert for you, um, but we are going to have more than one features uh, in this module. So uh, let's just call the first feature uh, let's just have a technical name for this. We actually don't need a uh, name here. We can move it to this uh, to this piece uh, because this basically like a, a general um, description for our for our module. But if you have multiple features, then the, then the actually useful information that can vary uh, by features like name, description, um, dependencies should be. Uh, declared per per feature, so I'm just going to move uh, description as well to that one. All right, so oh, why do you have? Okay, so uh, we have our module.txt ready. Now Orchard knows that okay, there's a new extension in town uh, with one feature that's called uh, Dojo Course 2. That module, uh, the main feature should be the same. Technical should have the same technical name as the module, uh, but we have a nicer name that will be displayed on the UI, and now we have a description which is also also displayed on the UI. So um, to be sure that everything's working all right, uh, let's just compile uh, the solution and let Orchard know uh, that we have these two extensions. We're we are also going to uh, try to run the application. Hopefully, uh, like this completely new module will not break anything. And we're going to see that it shows up uh, on the admin UI. And actually, we're going we're going to be able to enable it, but it won't do anything, so I will not enable it uh, yet. And hopefully, the completion will not take much longer than that. Okay. No. Why? Oh, okay. Orchard the text is running. So let's just reveal. So uh, yeah, actually, one of the things. Uh, usually, uh, like like uh, like it happened now, if you have Orchard the taxi running, it's also, it's locking on some of the DLL DLL files uh, because you know it needs uh, those libraries to run. So you can't rebuild the solution because Orchard the taxi is is working with them. But now rebuild all is succeeded, so I I will just hit Control F5 and uh, it will start the application with IS Express and we will see if what we did was okay or not, but it should be OK. Um, in the meanwhile, 
um, I would like to point out, uh, mostly to those that are watching these videos online, uh, that uh, the module development is, is in Orchard is heavily involved with the MVC paradigm or MVC design pattern because you know Orchard is built on ASP.NET MVC. So if you are not familiar with the MVC concept or what module, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> model um, controller and view means, then probably this is the good time to pause the video and uh, and find out about it. There's like a million different resources, tutorials, and descriptions on uh, over the interwebs, and uh, they will definitely help you out in uh, learning about this uh, concept, which is not very complicated. So, um, but it's important for Orchard. I'm just going to disable shape tracing because sometimes it can screw up with your uh, resources. Um, Sorry for my language. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, I knew that I forgot one of the parameters. So um, as you can see, our new feature uh, with the DojoCourse 2 module name and, uh, and the description now shows up in the admin UI, but it's in the uncategorized section. So what you can also do is add a category. So category should be Dojo. Why not? And please don't. Oh, okay, probably I don't have my uh, Visual Studio settings correctly. So as you can see now we have uh, category Dojo added, and uh, actually it will it will cause this module to jump down a few sections. But as you can see, if we scroll down in the Dojo category now, there's our feature. So what just happened? We have uh, used a code generation to create a new module. We have added the settings, the, uh, yeah, the uh, module TXT, sorry, the module TXT to define some basic parameters, and uh, now we have our own, our, our, our new module, and uh, we're just going to have to put some code into it to for it to do something useful. So the next step we are going to do is actually write code. So this is really exciting. So if you go to our module, we can actually use uh, scope to this. So we only see our module right here. Um, and if you right click on controllers and add a new class, we should create, uh, let's say, um, yeah, let's just stick to the plan and let's call it uh, your first Orchard controller uh, to be sure. Um, so now we have a new class in controllers, but you know, it's, it's just public class yet. It doesn't do anything. So if you want to make it, um, make it appear, uh, as a controller and, and you know for the MVC framework to recognize this class as a controller it's very simple you need to inherit it from the controller class and if you hit control dot you will see that this requires a using uh, system.web.mvc so now we have a controller and uh, but you know for the MVC routing to be able to uh, do something with it we also need uh, a method that will return some value and that will actually generate a route MVC will create a route from it, and we will be able to actually see it as a, as a page, um, so to say. So the only thing we need to do here is to add a method, let's say public action result, because that's the, uh, that's the most generic uh, type of uh, uh, class that you can return in a, in a controller action. And let's call it index. This is also an MVC convention, so if you call your uh, if you call your method index, then you don't need to actually write slash index just like it with, just like it happens with with web pages. When you open up a, a URL, if it has an index.php, for example, uh, then that will be the default page. You don't need to actually actually write index.php. This is the same thing. Um, and uh, the only thing we are going to do here is say that we are returning a view. So this is very cryptic. Uh, what what happens? How, how does MVC or how does Orchard know that what's going on here? Actually, this is, um, this is not really Orchard, this is only MVC uh, at the moment. But yeah, let's just return view. And um, well, if you look at the, uh, the folder structure, then you can probably guess that hmm, I have a views folder, so maybe I need to do something with it, right? Maybe put something there, so I don't know, MVC will recognize it and, and do something with it. And yeah, that's exactly what we're going to do. And according to the MVC um, uh, conventions, we need to create a subfolder uh, that is called your first orchard. So we are leaving the controller part from it. That's also part of the convention. 
So whenever we put um, view files, like CSS HTML files, uh, into, this, into this folder, uh, those uh, can be recognized by this controller and you know, uh, used as views, because these are views. Uh, so let's uh, add a new uh, view. I think this is the part where maybe Visual Studio will, yeah. Yeah, this is the part where, you, where Visual Studio usually uh, becomes unresponsive because it's doing some uh, initialization of templates in the background. And I probably should have just copied from, from one of the other Orchard modules. Um, hopefully, it will not completely kill uh, my machine. So this is, you know, like a fifth generation i5 CPU with eight gigabytes of RAM with an SSD and, you know, if you have if you have uh, stupid code, you can screw it up. So yeah, let's not let's not use this. Sorry, I will just copy. Uh, let's say we have our theme here, right? So the joker the theme we have this view. I will just copy paste it here and rename it to uh, index.cshtml. So now we have our controller. Inside our controller, we have an index method, and there is a corresponding template in views slash your first orchard slash uh, index CSHTML. And I'm just going to remove this content. And um, let's just do something very basic. And Zoltan explained earlier, we can use these strings. And as a general best practice, you should always wrap your user strings in T. Um, the reason being is that it doesn't add any performance overhead or problems. But when you want to go uh, and, uh, and localize your your modules and themes, and actually make your, uh, your make your website multi-language, it will be uh, a huge help if you did this in advance and not have to care about it later. So I'm just going to say hello to your course. And if I hit Control Shift S and uh, refresh this, probably in this case, uh, dynamic completion should work. Uh, but we will see after the break. <laughs> All right. so. We have compiled, or actually Orchard, very useful feature. Uh, Orchard compiled the solution for us, <laughs> I hope. Um, but it should have, should have been working. So it, it, it's going to be fine. If it's not, then whatever. But so Orchard uh, actually noticed that we have made some changes to our code. Uh, there's, a, there's basically a, like a watcher that is looking at uh, the CS approach files and the CS files. Basically, just looking at the timestamps, and now they actually compiled our controller. So let's go ahead and enable our module. And if it blows up, then we will start all over again. But it won't. Uh, just kidding. So uh, actually, one of the one of the things that you should probably keep an eye on if you are new with these things, or uh, I'm not new with these things, but it's still useful to you know periodically look at the the log files whenever you make uh, changes or enable a module that does something new uh, compared to what has been happening earlier. So uh, yeah, but the error log is empty. So we are happy. So um, let's just go to the, to the home page. And what's going to happen here is that we're going to see our home page because this is like a bunch of content. But how can we actually um, access what we, have, what we have written in our own module? So by default, the MVC writing works in a way that you have your application. Uh, you, have, you have your uh, base, base URL of your application. As you can see, it's localhost uh, port and Orchard local is like a basic, just a virtual directory for this application. And uh, the next thing that you're going to uh, have to include is the name of the area. And this is an MVC concept. Um, I'm not really going to go into details because you should know about this if you are if you are at this point in this video. Uh, this is an MVC concept, and every Orchard module and theme is basically an MVC area. So we have to include the name of the area. So uh, and that is Dojo Course to that module. The next thing next thing is to include is the name of the controller. So that's your first Orchard, and that's it. Because as I mentioned earlier, when you have a method called index. That's going to be the default action to execute when you are opening up the route of the controller. So if I come here, yeah, it says hello, hello, Dojo course. And uh, yeah, this is really nice, but you know, it's kind of strange that there's no, where, where's the theme, where's the other content, where are my navigation and stuff like that. So why don't I have anything here? Well, that's basically uh, because we need to use 
and other pins, uh, another another piece of uh, Orchard API, uh, which is actually an attribute, uh, and that is the themed attribute. So the themed attribute basically tells Orchard that okay, I have this uh, controller, I can actually put it in controllers, or uh, or actions individually. So I have this controller or, or action uh, where where I want to actually render everything. Uh, related to the layout, so I want a few full theming engine to kick in, uh, but I want to display this custom stuff. So I'm just going to say, I'm just going to add an attribute that is called theme. It, it is that easy. So uh, yeah, and just to keep the tidy, I'm just going to remove and sort using things because yeah, we are nice and we like to code our, we like to keep our code clean and tidy. So. Um, yeah, let's see what happens if I ref refresh the page. What should happen is that dynamic completion will kick in again. It will notice that I actually modified the controller. And when, I'm, when the page is reloading, it should also uh, render the full layout. But instead of displaying a content item or something like a widget or whatever, I have my action executed here. So this is how you basically extend the functionality of Orchard. Uh, in a very simple way. Uh, this is how you display something custom instead of a content item. Actually, I can display content items. So what I could also do through the Orchard API, and we will see those kind of stuff later, is that um, I'm going to select one specific content item and just render it, uh, render all the shapes that are related to it and display it on the front end instead of my text. But this is what we have here right now, a very, piece, a very simple piece of, uh, of logic that we have, uh, that we have added here. So if you want to do some more advanced stuff, um, you can also uh, use other pieces uh, of, the, um, of the Orchard API because you know, the theme attribute is really simple. It's just you know, kind of the look and feel. But Orchard is, is really a framework. It contains a lot of useful um, services and, and like a million things. There's more than 300,000 lines of code. And there's, uh, there's very useful things in there that you can use as a developer. So the next thing we're going to do is uh, create a controller. Oh, I actually don't. Yeah, let's not do that. I'm just going to add a new class. And let's call it uh, dependency injection controller. Oh, that sounds interesting. Oops. Uh, so. What's, what's with this funky name, dependency injection? What, what the hell is this? So dependency injection is, um, is a concept uh, that is related to, uh, to decoupling uh, in software development. Um, basically, dependency injection is part of a concept that is called inversion of control and inversion of control containers. What happens here is that when you are actually writing services, um, you are creating First, you are declaring the interface uh, that your, that your uh, service should satisfy. And in Orchard, uh, you also need to add another, you also need to inherit it from, uh, from another interface, or actually you can choose from three different interfaces. Uh, but the most basic one, and the one that you're going to use in 98% of the times is I dependency. So Orchard uses uh, Autofac as an inversion of control container. Um, and I dependency is a marker interface uh, that will actually define that I am creating a dependency. So now I have, uh, I have let's say, an interface uh, that inherits from uh, I dependency. As you can see, it's declared here. It does nothing. It's just a marker interface, just to basically signal Orchard that something uh, interesting is happening here. And whenever you are creating a service, you know you shouldn't just write, create a new class, add some methods, and then instantiate it with new my service. Uh, you should inherit it from your uh, from your interface, which is inheriting from I dependency. So inversion of control allows you to say that I have this service declaration in a form of an interface. Hey, Autofac, this is my service. Uh, declaration, and I have a couple of implementations here and there in different modules, in different places. It uh, doesn't really matter. And uh, when the application starts, basically Autofact will collect all the, all the different implementations corresponding to each of these I-dependency related interfaces. And uh, actually, in runtime, you will be able to choose, well, you will be able to uh, inject them, hence the, hence the expression dependency injection, which we'll look into it, uh, which we'll look into in a moment. 
um, you will be able to inject them. You will be able to inject just the last one that is registered because you can because um, modules can have dependencies between them. So it, they will those dependencies will be registered in the in in order according to the module dependencies, for example. So you can inject the last one. You can inject all of them and select uh, which one to run, or you can run all of them. Uh, so you can run the same method in all the implementations of a particular in interface. Uh, so basically, it allows you to decouple your service declarations from your service inter implementations, because in one module, you can implement a, an interface in one way. But if you want to do something else in another module, you, you might implement one or two methods or everything in a different way. Or it might connect to um, like a different caching service or um, a different storage. Uh, to, to fetch files and stuff like that. And there's actually examples to this in, in Orchard. So, uh, dependency injection controller. I actually don't have a very cool um, extension installed here, so let's just add something. No, we are going to do it uh, the old school way first, and then we are going to do it uh, the, as, as the cool guys do. So, dependency injection controller. So now we have a controller again. Uh, same same mantra. We need to inherit from controller. Simple enough, right? So let's say that whenever something interesting happens, I want to display some message to the user that is not really inside the content uh, zone. Uh, like it, uh, it should it should be able to uh, distinguish itself from from regular content. Uh, let's say to display a, a notification message, a warning, or, or when something bad happens and I want to display an error message because the user screwed up uh, and there's a, there's a stupid user exception. Uh, no, that doesn't happen ever. Um, so let's say we have our dependency injection controller and funny enough, if you want to display notifications, there's a dependency called iNotifier. So usually we add these uh, properties into our controllers as private read-only fields. You know, read-only means that it, the um, the reference can actually only be modified inside the constructor. So let's say that I and and it's private because I don't want to really expose it. It doesn't make really much sense to expose this particular property outside of the controller because I wouldn't use like new dependency injection controller dot whatever. Doesn't make sense. Um, the controller is really interesting for for the MVC framework itself. We are not interacting with this particular object in, um, from outside, except for a few special cases. Um, so let's say private read only I notifier. So that's the interface that is declared in one of the, the classes in Orchard. And there's actually a notifier class. Maybe it's called default notifier or just notifier. So let's say private read only uh, I notifier. And uh, as you can see, it comes from the orchard.ui.notify uh, interface, uh, namespace, sorry. And what we're going to do is give it a name. So usually, this is um, uh, a coding convention. I think it comes directly from C Sharp that when you have a private read only field, it should uh, start with an underscore. Uh, it should follow um, camel casing, but should start with you know uh, uh, lowercase letter. So let's just call this notifier. So now we have a property here, right? But it just says that this property will have will have a reference of of uh, of a type that satisfies i notifier. That's nice. It's read only, so I can't modify the reference outside of the class uh, outside of the constructor of this controller, and it's also private, so I can't access it from the outside of this class. Um, how does it get away, you, you might ask. Well, uh, oh, actually, in case it was too fast, so uh, if you want to add a constructor to a class, you can use the ctor snippet, it's built in. So you just type ctor, tab tab, and it's going to generate uh, the constructor. So actually, uh, dependency injection has different kind of injection uh, methods. There's property injection. If you want to actually use a property injection or, or a t-string inside your controller that's injected with a property injection, we're going to look at constructor injection in this case. Um, there's not really much difference. Uh, we're going to have to declare that this, uh, this constructor of this controller uh, should actually receive 
uh, an iNotifier implementation from the outside. And in this case, outside means out of fact. So out of fact is going to say that, oh, okay, this guy needs an iNotifier. Well, here's an implementation for that. So uh, this is what happens in the background. So let's say iNotifier because that's the uh, that's the interface or that's the um, uh, that is the interface that is that. Uh, uh, that this implementation we are we are receiving uh, has to has to satisfy. So I notifier and just say notifier. Um, this is the we are going to use this variable only in the scope of this uh, constructor, of course. So we are going to say notifier equals notifier. So simple enough. Basically, what happens is that um, I have declared that I I'm going to use this underscore notifier variable inside my controller wherever I want, but it needs to receive a value from somewhere and that is autofact where it receives the value from. So I'm just going to tell autofact that, hey, I need an iNotifier, okay? So autofact that says, hey, there it is. And I'm just going to save the reference into this private variable. Actually, there's a really cool feature uh, in, well, I'm not sure if it's testing, but it's, uh, there's a feature request for it in C Sharp for you to be able to um, define uh, the primary constructor. Sometimes it's referred to as primary constructor, sometimes it's default constructor. So to be able to define the, uh, the default constructor uh, with the name of the class, actually. So if that feature is implemented in, this, in, in Roslyn, then you will be able to do the same thing like this. Uh, I notifier. And you actually don't need all this stuff in that case. You will immediately have um, a variable with, uh, with the type I notifier, with the name notifier with lowercase, and uh, inside of the scope of your controller. So uh, yeah, but actually they were planning it to put it in C sharp six, which was released some quite some time ago. So it didn't happen. They were planning it then for C sharp seven, but that didn't happen again because they want to ship it together with another language feature. So it might come with C sharp eight, and it's going to be awesome. I. I really hope it's it's going to happen because it's great. So yeah, we are we don't actually uh, yeah make C sharp great again. It's great already, so it's okay. Um, so now we have an iNotifier implementation inside our controller. Let's do something useful with it. Um, we are going to say uh, so whenever the user just opens up this controller, and we are going to add a different. Uh, method to it. So let's say public action result uh, notify me just to stick to the plan again. Um, what we're going to do here is uh, basically use this very simple interface. So underscore notifier. So that's the variable we can use to access uh, the notifier implementation. As you can see, it has a couple of methods. It even has some extension methods. So you can um, you can display some message uh, with a simpler interface. Um, right away. So let's let's, let's just use um, information, and as you can see, it expects uh, a localized string. Now, where do I get my localized string from? So, if I want to just say "hello user," it doesn't work, right? Because this is just a regular string. I need a localized string. So the next thing we're going to do here is to properly inject a localizer. And uh, usually, this is kind of an orchard convention, how you do this. Um, but what you can add is a property. So uh, then not going to uh, use the prop uh, snippet here, just a simpler uh, like uh, declaration for it. So we're going, we're going to actually create, oh, well, Let's just use the, the prop snippet. So if you say prop, prop, tab, tab, is going to generate this code structure um, for a property inside this controller. And um, so if you want to, um, uh, if you want to use localized strings in your controller or any other type of backend code, you need to properly inject the localizer. So uh, this should be of the type localizer. And by convention, the name of this property should be T. You can also call it L because sometimes it, it collides with, uh, with the T character that you use for generics. Um, the convention is to use T, but I've seen examples for L uh, in, in such cases. So actually, it's really up to you. But 
to make it easier for other developers to read your code, I think it's easier to stick to the stick to the convention. So localizer, it's not recognized by default, but if we add the orchard.localization namespace, then we immediately have uh, have it recognized. Of course, if I were to use it this way, um, the same bad things would happen um, if I didn't have uh, this piece of code, it would just be a new reference, actually. So what we need to do here is use the new localizer. Um, it's basically a, a factory for you to be able to uh, inject, property inject the localizer into your class. So new localizer.instance is um, actually uh, the, the reference we need to add to our T property. So this way, um, we have a property called T, which always returns, um, uh, which can be used to return a localized string, and we have pro property injected it into uh, through our constructor. Um, so now we have a reference actually that we can use. So if I just uh, say T hello user, it's going to work. So that's really nice. Um, actually, the the um, notify method is, uh, or the notify me method doesn't actually return anything yet, but you know, it expects um, an action result. So another piece of uh, MVC API uh, that you can use is if you have uh, this method, you will do some funky stuff like displaying a notification, mm, but let's say that we don't really need to create a new template or anything like, like it again. Uh, let's just uh, redirect to our previous uh, to our previous um, action. So redirect to action. The name of the action is index, and the name of the uh, controller is your first orchard. So if we just go to dependency slash dependency injection slash uh, notify me. Uh, hopefully dynamic completion will work again and we will be redirected to the same place okay maybe not okay so let's let's rebuild and uh, probably i didn't save it let's rebuild and see what happens okay so now we have uh, recompiled our solution um yeah and let's see if it works really so what i did is did i name it correctly yeah so if you want to open up this particular action um we need to follow the same principle as before uh, with the other controllers, other action. So we need to include the name of the area, which is the name of the module, and then dependency injection without the controller. That's the name of our controller class, and then notify me, which is the name of the action. So, so if I hit enter, uh, hopefully, uh, as the application spins up after this rebuild, uh, I probably didn't press Control Shift S. Um, ah, yeah. Um, we will be presented with the previous uh, action. And the reason for that is because we redirected the user to the previous action, so this is exactly what we were expecting, except that now we have this hello user notification. So that's really nice. Um, let's, just, let's just say that we want to you know, personalize this message a little bit. So um, if we want to feel the user more welcome, and be, um, uh, let's say we want to display the name of the user because we want to greet the user in a proper way, uh, we can do that too. So, and for that, we are going to have to inject another uh, dependency. But before we do that, oh no, I have it installed. Okay, so I just forgot to put it in this uh, sidebar. So if you go to extensions and updates, and then um, search online for Lombic Orchard Visual Studio extension with this name. So if you go online and search, well, Lombic is probably enough. Yes, there's one extension. As you can see, it has a five star rating based on two words, but nobody's talking about the number of the words. It's always the, the rating that matters, right? Uh, so yeah, version 1.0, 500 downloads, that's probably all the people developing Orchard in the whole world, uh, half of them. Uh, so yeah, basically it adds some productivity tools uh, when you're developing Orchard. Um, the most important to know 
about here is injecting a dependency. So it really helps you uh, in a way that you need you don't need to write all this stuff uh, by hand. Well, you can use um, you can use snippets and stuff like that. But basically, what we do here is we want to inject another dependency. This is the uh, little window that we will be presented. Um, are you guys okay with the install? Should I stop here for a little bit? Okay. So let's move on. So now we have this little window here uh, where we can say that um, first what kind of uh, dependency we want to include and that is going to be I work context accessor. Ooh, what a fancy name, right? So here it is, I work context accessor. It allows you to access the work context. <laughs> Funny enough. And uh, for this particular um, Actually, yeah. So if you if you click this checkbox, it has some uh, uh, additional logic that is basically shortening uh, the name of the uh, name of the variable based on the segments of this interface. So it's going to use uh, the capital letters, which usually denote the starting of a word and just use those letters to create a variable name. We usually inject either context successor as underscore WCA. That's just kind of another convention. Uh, we don't really use, use it for, for everything. Either context successor is a very, very common uh, dependency that you usually include. So if you have uh, WCA reserved just for that, then you're fine. You're going to use it a lot of times and just easier to use that. And um, if you're developing Orchard for quite some time, then you probably you know, know it from the top of your head that WCA is always either context accessor. So let's add it. And what's going to happen here is that uh, a new private read-only field is added. A new uh, parameter is added to our constructor. Uh, it's also important to note that this only works if you have a constructor created. So in, you need to just add the constructor even, even if it's empty. And it's also going to add uh, WCA uh, the initialization, basically, of this property uh, to the body of this controller. And, you know, what's neat about this is that it recognizes that this first line is already here uh, and just going to add it after that. But it's not going to, you know, hurt this one, but it, it, it was coming after that. So it's, uh, I think it's, uh, I'm not sure if it's working regular expressions. Uh, maybe we need to ask, the, ask Mark how it happened. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah. So, um, of course, we have the squiggly lines, or however it's called in English. Um, let's add the namespace orchard. So, simple enough, this is a very, very uh, basic, not, well, not basic, but a very low level um, uh, dependency in orchard. That's why it's in the root namespace. Let's just remove all these usings, uh, useless usings. And uh, now we have the work on text accessor. So basically, it allows you to, uh, if you take a look at, well, first of all, it, uh, if you take a look at the interface, so you just, uh, if you click on the interface's name and hit F12, then you're going to jump to the definition of this interface. Um, well, it doesn't really give us much information, but we have the get context method, and this is what we are interested in. Uh, uh, right now, or actually uh, the get, con get context as well. So um, let's say that we need to access some interesting information about what's happening. Actually, we if you go to the definition of work context, then you're also going to find some interesting things here. So um, you have uh, the resolve method. This is one of the way that you can inject well, basically, resolve dependencies inside Orchard. When you are actually writing a controller, you shouldn't really use this. You should you should just use uh, dependency injection or constructor injection. Um, there are actually places where you, where you will have to use this, but that's uh, uh, that's a story for another day, maybe. Um, let's just jump over these things. So we have HTTP context, so we, we can access um, all kinds of information uh, regarding the particular request. That, uh, that is currently underway. Uh, we can access the layout shape from here. So what you can also do is to, to add, another, add the shape, 
created on the fly inside your controller uh, and injected into the layout at a specific place. You can also access the current site, uh, which basically means that you will, you will receive an eyesight object. So you can, you can check out the site settings, for example. So you can, you can uh, display um, the name of the site, for example, because that's stored there. You can access the current user. If the, the request is unauthenticated, it will be null. Otherwise, you can access information about the user. You can also look at some other information like current theme, current culture, current calendar, and current time zone. Um, and it's important to know that some of these information actually correspond to what you can see under settings. So these are actually the pieces of information regarding the site and what's happening um, with this request in a broad sense. Um, you can, you can actually define these kind of properties here um, and maybe other settings as well, but this is the main settings page and uh, this is the kind of the, the simplest way to um, retrieve this information. Another thing you can do is to use the content management API of Orchard and, um, and basically get the site content item because uh, it's it's interesting, but this is not basically an MVC controller where you have some fields and, and update it. This is an editor. This is a content item editor. And there's a special type of content item in Orchard called the site. And this is the editor of the site content item. So if you, if you retrieve the content item of ID 1 uh, from the content management API, which we'll look into that uh, later, um, then you can actually re, uh, access the same kind of information, but this is another way to expose these. So let's jump back to dependency injection controller. Now we have a work context accessor, and I'm just going to cheat here to see uh, if we have something uh, not to forget that is so important. But yeah, so the first thing we're going to do here is figure out whether we have an unauthenticated or an authenticated request. And the simplest way to do that is basically to access the current user. So let's just say var current user equals wca dot uh, get context dot uh, current user. I'm just actually going to factor it out to a different variable to keep the code tied in case we will need it later. So I will have a work, work context variable where, I, where I'm um, requesting the context or the work context from this work context accessor. And um, one of the uh, properties of the work context is the current user. So the current user, as you can see, is an orchard the security dot i user. Uh, so at, of, of the type um, that satisfies or actually inherits from, uh, oh, sorry, implements i user. Um, and if you look at a user, it's not very complicated. It has a username and an email address and nothing else. Um, how, um, how you have password management and role-based access control and other stuff like that is uh, kind of a different story. But this is in the Orchard of Security namespace, so it's coming from the framework. This is like a very, very low level, very simple representation of a user. It has a, a username and an email address. And uh, basically the, the um, the content management uh, parts of the framework and some custom code adds additional functionality that allows um, the concept of users to become something more complex that really has like a password and roles and whatever you want because you can, you can shape uh, these to your liking. So now we have access to the current user and what we're going to say is that we are going to generate some uh, to, to retrieve the name of the user. Uh, from this current user object, and what we're going to do is say var username equals, uh, let's say, if current user equals null. So if it's in null reference, that means that the user is unauthenticated. We are dealing with an in, with a, with an anonymous user. So we're going to use the shorty for ternary operator in this case. Um, if you are not familiar with it, it's very simple. We have a boolean expression here. Uh, we have a question mark that denotes the end of this Boolean expression, and we're going to have two cases like if else. First, we have the the, the true case and the false case. So this is actually uh, like valid uh, in terms of um, in terms of syntax, 
but it doesn't really make sense to write this. It's just to denote what happens in this uh, operator. So instead of true, if it's if it's really null, then we are going to say anonymous. Oops, it's an mouse. No, that's anonymous. And since this is a string, this is a boolean. There's a type mismatch. And but if if it's not null, then it's safe to say that current user dot username because the user always has a username. We don't even really need a, a null or empty check on this one. Um, but there's another um, cool way to do this. You can write this uh, with different syntax as well. Like uh, you can use the Alice operator for C -sharp, from C sharp six, but we want to use C sharp six here. C -sharp, C sharp six. This is hard. Uh, language features because dynamic compilation can't handle uh, can't handle uh, C sharp six, uh, unfortunately. But it will at point at point at some point. Um, so now we have the username, or actually we know. We have some string that is actually corresponding to the user. We don't really care about what it is at this point. We just have a username, so we are happy. And uh, you know, to make this um, uh, to make this a little bit more personal, uh, we're going to say hello, not user, but we're going to use uh, the string dot format type of uh, usage of uh, of the t string because t string is basically a wrapper for for uh, string dot format. And we're going to say username. So if I hit save and uh, go back to our uh, controller here, oops, notify me, and dynamic completion will kick in, and we're going to see a little bit different type of notif or, or con uh, notification with a bit different content, also redirected to the same page as before, or maybe not. Uh, let's see. Okay, let's rebuild again because maybe it's it's broken. Oh, I actually made a mistake here. Sorry. And let's rebuild. Um, okay, so we have rebuilt our solution, uh, but you but you didn't see that uh, because uh, we are not recording that uh, that time. Sorry for your time, guys. Um, yeah, so I, I just made a, a simple mistake. It's uh, it's very embarrassing because it's going to be on YouTube, so everyone is going to see that I made uh, made this little mistake. But anyway, um, it's it's okay. I will fix it in post production. So uh, we're going to use uh, we're going to display a different notification. Um, you know what? Um, yeah. Anyway, so let's go back to this one again. You know why it says not found. So why does it say not found? Because if you have actually a compilation error, um, which involves dynamic compilation, and of course we had a compilation error because I made a, a syntactic mistake, uh, then you know com dynamic compilation will will not be able to compile this this whole module, so it will, will it will it won't be loaded at all. So basically, what happens in this case is that this whole expansion won't be loaded into the application, so none of the controllers in this particular module will be accessible because, you know, uh, dynamic compilation couldn't compile the DLL and the extension is not loaded because we don't have a DLL for it. So hopefully we have, yeah, hello admin. So, you know, I'm so narcissistic that I greeted myself with this, uh, with this notification, which is great. I'm, I'm really happy that I'm here. And uh, yeah, so our code works. Uh, let's go one step further. We're going to take a look at another kind of low-level um, uh, service or, or dependency, and that is called I HTTP context accessor. So if you go back to tools, yeah, for some reason it's it's on the top for me, but not for you guys anyway. So I'm just going to say I HTTP context accessor, and you won't guess, but it it basically allows you to access the HTTP context. Fascinating. And this is also like um, another kind of convention that we usually follow is to, to use it with a short field name, just HCA. So let's add this dependency. And again, we get the squiggly lines. I hope it's the, the correct word because otherwise I'm using um, a wrong word for something, but consistently, which is better than, you know, being inconsistent. So I have HTTP context accessor here, and uh, let's say we want to 
display for some cryptic reason uh, the current URL to the user. So the HTTP context is exactly what it says. It's, uh, it's basically the, everything related to this HTTP request. And obviously it contains uh, some information about what URL we are currently uh, looking at. So let's just say um, var current URL, set URL equals, so let's just say underscore HCA dot uh, current. And we should just have, oh, sorry. So we should just have, um, yeah, we are looking at the request object. Ooh, what am I doing? Sorry. So we are looking at the request object, which is of the type HTTP, um, sorry, uh, HTTP request base. And the request has a URL, not so surprisingly. Um, we can also look at the row URL, whatever. It doesn't really matter. We just call the two string method on it. So, you know, in this case, all we care about was this URL. I just want a string. I don't care about anything else. Just give me a string. So, um, the next thing we're going to do is include this particular information for some reason, because it sounds cool or looks cool uh, as an end result, into this notification. So I'm just going to say hello to whatever, and just to denote it from, from the previous um, variable. So as you can see, I moved the user into the first uh, or the index one, index one uh, variable, uh, but this is, of course, indexed from zero. So we, this is where we are going to include current URL. So, you know, we string the format, current URL will occupy this spot and username uh, this one. But, you know, just to be sure that it's easier to read, I'm going to wrap it in double quotes. And since, uh, you know, double quote is a, is a correct character that, the, that has a syntactical meaning, I need to escape it in this string. So, uh, hopefully, this time we didn't uh, we didn't break anything, and we can actually see dynamic compilation again in action because it's really great that it's working. So it's good not to break it because it makes our life a lot, lot easier. So I'm just going to open up the same URL as before. Um, what we should see here is that um, uh, we are going to be redirected to the same URL again, uh, which is where we are currently at, but we are going to see a different notification, slightly different notification again. So let's see what happens. Uh, yeah, this is the part where we have the drums and yeah, awesome. So uh, our notification now says hello to blah, blah, blah URL. This is of course uh, the original one. So slash dependency injection slash notify me. This is not actually the, the URL we are, we are at right now because we redirected the user. Uh, to a different controller action, but of course uh, displaying or actually fetching the URL happened before that. So actually our application is, is at this point is still at the previous URL, and now we are redirected, or at this URL, and now we are redirected to this one. But yeah, we have our updated notification. And um, so these are some very, you know, basic pieces of, uh, of the Orchard API, exposing some important information related to what's happening with the user, with the request, and uh, to, um, to make sure that whenever something bad happens, let's say um, we are displaying an error here for some reason because the user did something wrong or uh, there's some malicious input um, by the user that is not detected by the framework, um, because you know, SQL injection uh, attempts are are usually um, uh, called by the framework when you are posting a form, for example. But if you have some other type of malicious um, uh, input that is uh, uh, that is provided by the user, and you can actually catch it, um, you might say that um, yeah, I'm going to display a warning that or, or an error message that you shouldn't really do this. But if you are a developer um, or some DevOps person wants to look at uh, what's happening with the application without actually seeing the application, that you then one of the useful things you can do is to log an error message. So um, this is very useful if something unexpected happens in the application that really needs to uh, some action taken, like um, 
yeah, like a security breach attempt or something like that, or whatever reason you want to lock something. And there's another piece of uh, piece of API that you can use for that, and it's uh, injected in the same way as localizer. And we're going to take a look at the uh, logger. So um, it's another no. Um, it's another property that we're going to um, inject. And with the not luger, <laughs> that that has another um, pronunciation. So uh, we're going to say um, I want to. Sorry, did I? I logger. Yeah, of course. Sorry. So I logger, uh, and the variable name is logger. So uh, we need to add this as we are using. It's coming from the orchard logging namespace. Just to be sure, let's look at the interface. Well, uh, this is very simple. This is not to be. Uh, uh, this is not something that is hard to use, you know. Um, let's inject it as a property. So, if you want to say logger equals, and we are um, actually injected in the same way uh, through this factory called new logger, and the same way new logger dot instance. So now we have a reference uh, to an object that is of the type i logger. So let's say that I want to uh, log an error message. Um, I could choose to, to log a warning or, a, or an information. Uh, by default, uh, some of the log, uh, log levels are, are actually not flushed to log files. So we're going to use errors because those are always flushed. Well, if you, you can override it, of course. So you can even set up your application not to log errors, uh, which is stupid. But I don't know, for some reason, you might want to do that. Uh, so it may not be <laughs> stupid. Um, but you know, by default, errors are always logged. So we're going, to, we're going to log an error message to see how it works. So let's say logger dot. And we have like uh, the log uh, and is enabled, which is coming from iLogger. And we have some extension methods here, here, extension methods here that are actually making our life easier. Uh, so we're going, we are going to use logger.error. And um, in this case, uh, we are just going to display some message. You don't really need to use these strings here. It doesn't really make sense to use these strings here um, because, uh, because this, is an, uh, this is not a user string. You are basically putting it into a text file that some DevOps person or, uh, you know, at, um, is, is going to take a look at. Uh, or, or a developer, maybe, uh, probably. Uh, in this case, a developer, of course. So they're going to take a look at and see what's, what happens, what's wrong. I need to fix something that isn't really causing a runtime error, but it still needs to be taken care of. So um, we're just going to just say the user has been greeted. Um, this is not really an error, but this is just the way that it's easier for us to actually flush it into a log file. So we are going to jump back. Uh, and now it, this time it's really uh, useful that we have this notification here because it's easier for me to copy paste the route. So we're going to open up our previous uh, URL again, <coughs> uh, slash dependency injection slash notify me. And after dynamic compilation, we will see the same notification uh, with the same text coming from the U that, that is provided by uh, this section that we have redirected to. But if you take a look at logs, you will see that the error log is now one kilobyte instead of zero. And it was changed today at uh, 2.51 uh, in the afternoon, which is exactly the time now. So let's see uh, what happens here. And this is basically like a default configuration of what an, uh, what an error message or a log entry looks like. It has the timestamp, the process ID. Uh, so this is the ID of the process, I think. Um, but we can take a look at the configuration uh, of this IS Express uh, server. This is the class um, where, the, where the message is coming from or the error has been logged. Default is the name of the tenant. Uh, and this is, I think, a spoiler alert for you uh, for a feature that is called multi-tenancy. Don't, you don't really need to care about it right now. Um, 
but it's going to be important at some point. And now we have this message here. So the user has been greeted and we also have the URL here. So, you know, if you have a bunch of uh, query strings in your URL, so your message is specific to some user input through query strings, then you also have the URL here, which is very useful because it's easier for you to replicate, um, replicate the problem or reproduce the problem. So yeah, we are happy. And um, this is how you display um, a warning or, or, um, or a notification or log an error message and actually do some MVC related stuff uh, like redirecting to a uh, user to another method, um, property injection and constructor injection, which is under the umbrella term dependency injection are the way for you to use orchard related services and built in functionalities. Um, and yeah, MVC is awesome, but Orchard is even more awesome. And we're going to find out uh, how, how great is it um, in the next few sections.